Over the millennia, civilizations have risen and died beside the fertile marshlands of Mesopotamia. They're said to be the site of the Garden of Eden and the birthplace of Abraham and Noah. Those who lived here developed trade, writing and farming and harvested the reeds for their shelter and fuel. Their hospitality was celebrated and still is. Rahim Menshad is a farmer. From his home on the edge of the marshlands, he's witnessed the unspeakable suffering of his neighbors, the Marsh Arabs, at the hands of Saddam Hussein. These derelict houses litter the southern marshlands of Iraq, a legacy of the Saddam era. The villages were destroyed many of them bombed, their occupants either killed or fleeing for safety. In the early 1990s, researchers estimated that the Marsh Arab population numbered about a quarter of a million. Today, there are less than 40,000. The marshes were unspoiled wetlands, sitting on top of known oil reserves. But by draining most of their water and expelling the marsh Arabs, pristine wetlands were turned to scorched earth. The United Nations called it one of the world's most catastrophic environmental disasters. From the perspective of the engineering point of view, it's an incredible feat. I cannot but help admire the engineering skills needed. But of course, in this instant, it was done for uh, the worst crime of the century, worst environmental crime of the century, not to speak anything about the humanitarian aspect of this. This is the tail end of the, of the Glory River. Mm -hmm. The son of an Iraqi uh, district uh, engineer, Dr. Azam Olwash, <laughs> often visited the marshes as a child 30 years ago.
يعني صدام حسين يجب ان يعاقب قتل الحيوان، قتل الثروه، قتل الحياه في هذا في هذا الغابات الجميله. Kaatham Anazun is known as Sheikh of the Marshes. He heads the political wing of the Marsh Fighters Association, a militia armed and funded by a leading Shiite party with a mission to topple Saddam Hussein. Now that fight is over, Sheikh Kaatham's focus is the welfare of the Madan. Since Saddam's fall, many have emerged from hiding or banishment and returned to the marshes. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum. Allah yisaadak hajjina. Shuan ahwalak. Ya marhaba bil'aam. Al-akil, al-ghadha, al-ilaj, al-duwa. Anta mu'azharna. Anta mu'azharna. Reversing Saddam's devastation requires international help. A task force with experts from North America, Europe and Australia is currently surveying the terrain. Hundreds of millions of dollars are pledged for rehabilitation. But after years of abuse, the dilemma is whether the marshes can or ever should be reflooded. Why didn't they speak about this crime? Why didn't they say anything? And you know, I, Did people I, really know the extent of what had gone on, though? Yeah, I'm a lonely voice in the wilderness. Azam Olwash left Iraq for America 23 years ago. This whole area is now flooded. Okay. His project, Eden Again, is one of several rehabilitation schemes. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, now it's, it's this whole thing is water. An international master plan is due by the end of the year. The flooding the marshes, it's as easy as destroying small embankments, disabling pumps. But we know for a fact today that there is not enough water to completely restore the marshes. Flooding the marshes and restoring are not necessarily one and the same. You need to try to allow nature to reclaim the area, prevent invasive species from taking place. So it's a very complex question to answer. It's not simple. It's not as simple as turning the tap on. Because to start with, there's less water. Since 1990, Turkey and Syria have built dams higher up on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. For Dr. Olwash, regenerating the marshes is more than a dream. It's his life's mission. If you've ever been in, in the marsh the way it was, you'd know that it's, it's a temple to God, it's a temple to nature. It's the only place where I feel peaceful in Iraq. You achieve harmony. What can I tell you? I want that feeling back. I, more importantly, I want my children to feel that too. <laughs> Reinventing the past won't be easy. Life on the marshes isn't what it used to be. Fresh water has to be brought in on roads which become impassable after rain. Some of the dry beds are again filled with water, but after years of desiccation, it's brackish and there are hardly any fish. In this village, there's no electricity, no shops and no schools. Kids and animals grow up together, oblivious of the world around them. نصف مليون إنسان كانوا يسترزقون 
من الاهواء الان هذا العدد الهائل كله بدون عمل وتشوف التمريتوا على مناطق وشفتوا الاكواخ مال الطين والبيوت البسيطه بكل مكان لهاي الناس تعبانه حتى مورد اكل وشرب ما عته Nineteen year old Hannah Ranam and her twelve year old brother Shamil collect reeds to feed the livestock. Though the nearest village is a few kilometers away, they've never been to school. <laughs> Their mother, Hosnia, explains how she feeds 14 mouths bread made from government flour rations, eggs from the chickens and fresh milk from the cow. Hosnia makes brushes out of palm fronds. Yesterday, she sold 20 of them for one dollar. She's heard of schemes to re-flood the marshes, but she doesn't understand how that can make a difference to her family. <laughs> Sheikh Kadam makes a fact-finding visit to the small village of Kreda in the Hama Marsh. It's home to the Shirabna tribe. Sheikh Kadam wants to raise the Madan's standard of living. Word gets around that an esteemed visitor has arrived. The Sheikh is anxious for the international millions to improve the lives of the Marsh Arabs, but he doesn't trust the Iraqi government's involvement. إذا تريد تجي مساعدات أو السولف إنه ويا الجهات الرسمية اللي بأستراليا وبغير دول من تجي مساعدات خل تجي عن طريقنا عن طريقنا لأنه هاي الناس اللي بالأهوار ناس تعبانة وإحنا اللي نوزع لأنه من تجي عن طريق الدولة الدولة تسرق أو تروح بغير بغير طريقة ثابتة. Abdul Bari is a village elder. He's witnessed the decline of his people over the past 20 years. لا عندنا إمكانية إن نبني حواش شنو الإمكانية كهرباء لا عندنا ما لا عندنا ويا استواجد ولا عندنا الآلة تمشي الآلة شنو هي لا شارع مريح مثل أنت من تيجي بالشارع كنت ترتاح لي فالشارع هذا من تيجي تمشي عليه كنت ترتاح له ما ترتاح له فبح الحالة هاي ما حد ولا إنسان يجانا جاوبنا مثلك Abdul Bari isn't concerned with scientific schemes to restore the marshlands. His only thoughts are for the survival of the next generation. إحنا لو نرجع للمدينة ونشوف إنه مكان اللي يساوي في في اللي يفيد أطفالنا ويفيد شبابنا. شنو شبابنا؟ اللي يفيد شبابنا أول يشتغل بدائرة والدائرة نظيف ومرتاح. الثانية طفلنا يشتغل بالمدرسة ويدرس. شلون انت هسه تفهم احسن من عدي ودارس فهذا كيف فهم احسن من عدي فاحنا تاخرنا وهم اطفالنا تتاخر فهذا نقصد عليه ونحكي عليه inside the tribal meeting house conversation turns to the needs of the marsh arabs the visiting sheikh of the marshes is confronted with a new problem armed conflict among the different marsh tribes. زين انتم الان عندكم اسلحه تكفي 
وفين نوع سلاحتكم؟ هسه اي سلاحتنا عندنا عندنا بكيشي قاذفه كله موجود يا خوال والله ونعمه كله موجود بالعكس اول ما جيت After years of neglect and abuse by governments the villagers describe a debilitating feud with their neighbors the Garamsha tribe هاي مهمه انا متكفل ومسوي بها جدول Over the years there have been tit for tat murders the blood feud has made the isolated Sharabna people suspicious and fearful. Despite the presence of an esteemed visitor, the elders, including Abdul Bari, can't hide their frustration. By the time Sheikh Kavam departs Kreda village, he's promised the marsh dwellers a resolution to their feud as well as funds and untold comforts. There are no guarantees that the fish will return, even if the water does, and that their hungry bellies can be filled. Far upstream on the banks of the Tigris River, Dr. Azam Olwash outlines his vision to modernize the marshes. We really need to uh, provide them with potable water, we need to provide them with uh, electricity and sewage treatment. I dream of having a computer inside each one of those huts. <laughs> Can you imagine the kids playing uh, and talking to somebody in America or Australia? <laughs> uh, a little hub. So they'll have the internet, electricity and roads, but they'll still be in this pristine marshland environment? That's my hope. That's, That's my dream. That sounds like a bit of a pipe dream, doesn't it? Uh, well, well come, come back in five years, let's see. <laughs> A familiar shape appears on the river. A lone canoe known as a mashuf, more commonly found hundreds of kilometers away in the marshes. Azam Olwash's hunch is correct. The men are former marsh dwellers, forced to leave the marshes to earn a living. Are you amazed to see marsh Arabs in Baghdad? Uh, I mean, the minute I saw the guy polling, I told you he's from the marshes. <laughs> this is just, I mean, it, it's great, but it's also a testament to how sad the last 10 years have been. I mean, people having to leave their relatives, coming out, I don't know, 700 kilometers away, I don't know, I don't even know the distance less than that, but just uh, trying to make their living, just, nah. Anyway. There's hope. <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> With outside help, the Madan may recover from their catastrophe, though today they are amongst Iraq's most impoverished. To Saddam Hussein, they were rebels and outcasts to be destroyed. Now, modernization could be just a few years away. And for the second time in a generation, upheaval is coming to the marshes.